let's take a look at signal path. Well, firstly, what do I mean by signal path? Put simply, signal path is the journey the signal takes through a system. All signals need to get from A to B. The output of a microphone needs to get to the speaker to be amplified or into the DAW to be recorded. But we can't just plug the mic into a speaker, can we? And what if we need maybe more mics, maybe two or three or even more? A good understanding of signal path is fundamental to understanding audio engineering. In a typical digital audio workstation, or DAW as I keep referring to it, there are two main physical elements, the computer that runs the DAW software and an audio interface. The audio interface is a two-way device. Firstly, it digitizes audio it receives in its inputs and sends that digital information to the host computer. Then the computer processes that information and outputs it in digital format to the audio interface again, and that turns it back into analog information that can be listened to by musicians and engineers. The brilliant thing is that once audio has been digitized, it can be transferred along a single cable, unlike its analog equivalent that needs at least a single cable for each channel of information. Similarly, information coming back from the computer also uses a single cable. So USB or Thunderbolt, for example, will do the job of both sending the information and returning it. Perhaps the simplest single path is a single microphone going into a DAW and the backing track and the vocal microphone signal being sent to the musician's headphones. So the microphone gets plugged into the input of the audio interface and this gives us perhaps the most important rule about signal path in that outputs always flow to inputs. We can't plug inputs into inputs or outputs into outputs or nothing will happen. Anyway, back to our door. The microphone's analog signal is digitized by the interface and sent back to the computer which then outputs it along with the backing track to the audio interface which changes it back to an analog signal that's sent via a small amplifier to the musician's headphones you can clearly see a, a sort of loop of signal. When we plug mics into a mixer, the signal from the mic goes down the input channel uh, along a bus where it gets mixed with the other outputs of the other input channels and then output to the master output or to our powered speakers or an amplifier and then the speakers. It's nice and straightforward, but it's worth understanding what's happening in each input channel. So let's zoom into an input and see exactly what's going on. The first stage of our input channel is incredibly important. It's called the preamplifier. And this is where we can do a number of things to condition the signal before it carries through the rest of the input. The preamp is, of course, where we find the input sockets. For mics, this is the XLR socket. An input will always be a female socket with receptacles for the pins of a male XLR. As far as XLRs are concerned, inputs will always be female and outputs male. It means we can't plug outputs to outputs or inputs to inputs. Then we have the line level jack socket into which we can plug devices like keyboards that have jack outputs, but not guitars. More about that later. Then we have a socket named insert or insert point. We'll look at that in more detail later too. The most important control is the gain or trim control. This is vitally important as we need to optimize the signal for the input channels electronics. Dynamic microphones will have a small output level, so this may need to be turned up. Uh, whereas condenser microphones and line level sources have higher level inputs, so the gain control will be lower. There's usually a visual indicator of signal level, lights or meters to indicate you've turned up the gain up or down for the best possible level. As well as the input sockets and the gain control, there'll be a number of switches related to the preamp. These are the most common. Condenser mics need power, and that comes from the phantom power switch, which might be marked with the number 48, as that's the maximum voltage it'll be sent to the mic. Then we have a high pass filter, which reduces the level of low frequencies coming into the channel. This can be very useful for live work. Then a switch which selects whether the signal from the jack socket or the mic signal from the XLR is going through the gain control and then to the channel. The next switch is a more recent innovation. While I said earlier that electric guitars shouldn't be plugged into the line input, if your preamplifier has a switch like this, you can do this as it changes the line input to expect a level of signal from an electrical bass guitar, which is quite low, very like dynamic microphones in fact. The next two switches tend to be found only in higher end devices. The pad switch, first of all, reduces the input level by a predetermined amount, usually 10 decibels or so. Uh, so if an input signal is really loud, using the pad switch will reduce the input level to the channel by its marked amount. Finally, a phase switch which flips the incoming phase upside down and thus inverting the wave. Don't worry if you don't have all of these in your interface or mixer, you'll have some combination of them though. Let's zoom in on the insert point now. It can appear confusing but it's actually very simple. 
let's say for the sake of an argument that we want to compress the output of a condenser mic, maybe for a vocal. We plug the microphone into the preamp. As it's a condenser microphone, we need to make sure the phantom power is on. Then we adjust the input gain correctly to make sure we're optimizing the operation of the channel after it. The signal coming out of the preamp is now sent to the insert with a single TRS, tip ring send, jack plug that uh, uh, the output of the preamp connects to the tip of the jack plug which is connected to the input of our compressor. The output of the compressor is then connected to the ring element of the TRS jack. That's connected to the next part of the channel and the signal that's been compressed carries on through the electronics of the channel. It's actually very simple. You may have noticed on the mixer channel of a door that the very top of the channel is called inserts and this is where we apply plug-in processors like compressors so the signal flows through them in the same way as through a physical compressor via an insert point. There are five inserts here uh, and they're ordered from top to bottom so the signal in the door passes through one and then into two and then into three and then into four and then into five one after the other. This is a direct emulation of the insert point in the real world and plugins applied at this point will only affect that channel. Let's have a look at the signal path through a channel. So the signal comes in at the preamp where we set the level, then it flows to the EQ. After the EQ, it flows to the pre-fade sends. Worth looking at that lecture on its own to get the full rundown of what they do. Then the signal flows to the output fader. The signal from the fader goes in a few directions, firstly to the pan control for routing to the left and right outputs, but also to the post fade sends where the signal can be sent to effects processors, for example. And let's not forget our insert point. It's after or post the preamplifier, but before the rest of the channel like this. So we want to compress the signal. That's how we plug it in. So for more detail on signal path, uh, have a look at the lecture on buses and sends uh, if you haven't.